Today we begin our deep dive into the Gloom Spite Gits. This is the latest faction to join the war for the Mortal Realms. We're going to spend the rest of the week diving into the faction in depth. Talk about each of the sub-factions, the Moon Clan Grots, Spider Fang, and the Trogoths. And the heroes that bind this band of lunatics together. But today we're going to start kind of at a, at a bird's eye view with an overview of what the Gloom Spite Gits really are. And to do that, we need to talk about two things first. Two pieces of information that are vital to understanding really all aspects of this faction, their beliefs, their ideology, how they practice those beliefs. And that is Gorgomorka and the Bad Moon. Now, I did a video about Gorkamorka some time back, and I'll put a link in the description down below for you. Simply put, he is the god of the destruction factions. Really a god of disorder, of tearing down civilizations and things like that. Not in a chaos way, a, an evil way where chaos factions want to subjugate and rule the realms. This is about unbridled freedom, all restrictions off its predator, prey, and the food chain. There's this natural ferocity that infects every vision of him. Now, one thing about Gorkamorka that I really love, and, and the reason why I frankly don't think we'll ever truly see a model for him, is that he's depicted in so many different ways by each of the factions that follow him. To the Iron Jaws, he's a giant orc, or two-headed orc sometimes. Two orcs when he's Gork and Mork, and they come together and make Gorkamorka as one two-headed orc. But he's a warrior god who's going to ultimately lead the Great Wa. A massive campaign, really, where it's led by Gorkamorka, and they obliterate all fortresses, civilizations on any other side. That's all the death factions, all the order, uh, and um, of course the chaos stuff as well. But just kind of going through the realms and clearing out anything that is not as kill or be killed as them. To the Bone Splitters, he is this wild beast spirit that inhabits all the huge monsters that live in the realms. And by hunting those beasts and kind of releasing that energy from the bones, that is their act of worship to Gorkamorka. Well, within this battle tome, we are presented with three sub-factions that have really come together to form a cohesive army. I say cohesive in some pretty strong air quotes there. You have the Moon Clan Grots, who are see Gorkamorka as this warrior god, absolutely, and they do also understand the idea of the Great Wa, but their role in that is a little bit different. We'll talk about that when we talk about the Bad Moon. Then there's the Spider Fang, who also revere Gorkamorka, but they more worship the aspects that he has brought to the realms rather than he himself. And thirdly, the Trogoths, who frankly are just kind of described as being too stupid to know the difference. So I really do encourage you to watch that video on Gorgomorka to learn more. So we have this rampaging god of destruction and war, and how does that apply to a race of super tiny, weak grots? Because fundamentally their understanding and worship of a god of war would be fundamentally different than uh, huge armies of green skins like the big orc and iron jaws that are all about warfare, very much in your face. Well, this is where the second part of that kind of foundational information comes in, that's the bad moon. The battle tome kind of jumps back and forth between talking about facts and myth and how they kind of blend together. So it's, it's, you have to piece it together, really. But put as simply as I can, the Bad Moon is a celestial object that flies from realm to realm and across them. So it'll be in all points in Akshi and then bounce from Akshi over to Hish and then just kind of bounce around like a pinball across the mortal realms. It's called the Bad Moon, but it's technically not a moon in the sense that it doesn't orbit anything. It has a frantic, non-ballistic motion. They will turn on a dime. No one can really predict, or at least as I should say, the order factions who study the heavens cannot even predict where it's going to go. It acts like it has its own will and power to mo move itself, and it can change course randomly at any time. Sometimes it'll slow down over a crawl and it'll spend days and weeks in an area. Other times it will hastily go through the void from realm to realm, bouncing around as it sees fit. When it's over you, it appears as a massive moon, right? And this big planetoid in the sky that glows sickly white, and it has this leering grin on it. The reason it's called a bad moon, one, obviously it's a planetoid, it hovers over you like a moon would, but also because it's this giant orb that shows light differently. Sometimes it is that thin crescent line of a moon, but sometimes it's that fat, round, perfect sphere in the sky. So it makes sense, I and mean, you, you can look at that and say, oh, that's a moon, obviously, but technically speaking, it's not. 
Now, as I said before, the scholars in Isaiah who study the heavens constantly have tried to understand this and track its motions and predict where it's going to go. They've all failed, and the Skaven themselves have done the same thing. However, they tried to blow it up, and they, there's some rumblings about how a uh, Skaven clan many moons ago was able to do that. Uh, of course, they're referring to the events of the end time, so it's a good little throwback there. But the Skaven are also involved, uh, a race that is just as chaotic and crazy and unpredictable can't understand it. Even powerful wizards who can sense the motion of this energy can't really understand what's going on. And the Battle Tome does go out of its way to note, and this is important, that the Bad Moon has existed since the time of the realm's founding, meaning it has always been a thing. It does also say that during the Age of Myth, there's this point in time where it just kind of stayed in the void, meaning it wasn't actually anywhere that people could see it, but it was known to be there. So it's always existed. It seems to be an integral aspect of the realms, really baked into the universe itself. It's just that the events of malign sorcery where Nagash set off the necroquake and magic is going awry that it has started this rampaging motion at high velocity realm to realm all across the realms changing speed and orientation on a, on a whim it's really gone up a notch and so this incredible increase of action is what is drawing the gloom spike gets from their dens it's described as being like a mad boulder. A good way to look at it is like a runaway train where it's just this uh, object that is barreling at you and nothing really can stop it. And so now we'll kind of transition into uh, the myths around it, right? Because knowing something exists and why people worship it are two different things. And there's several clans of Gloom Spike Gits and they all have very different origin stories. The Moon Clan Grots, who derive their name from the Bad Moon, have a story where Gorka Morka was really hungry. He'd drunk an ocean. Uh, he was eating entire forests, like munching on trees. And then he saw the bad moon come over him. And so he reached up, grabbed it, tried to eat it, but it was so tough that he broke his teeth off in it and then kind of gave up. Well, his teeth, the power of a god, was then infused to this random planetoid. And it became sort of a hub, if you will, of destruction energy, this kind of wah energy that exists. And, uh, and that's now, now why, when it bounces around, it draws out destruction armies. So it is not Gorkamorka, but it is infused with his power. So you could see this as being like a religious artifact that exudes the power of their deity. The spider fang elements of the army have a very different story for the Bad Moon. Because in their kind of mythos that they have built up, there is a god beast who is a giant spider. Now, we explored god beasts a little bit when we tackled the Realm Gate Wars. You can go watch that video. But essentially, they have a god beast that they revere who is a giant spider. And this giant spider, at some point in time, bit Gorkamorka's toe. And just like the same origin story with the Bad Moon, also with that, uh, where the power of a god was transferred to a different object. This time, the power of Gorkamorka was infused into that god beast spider. So now you have this giant god be spider who has the power of a god of destruction and what the bad moon is is basically a giant silk spider egg and they believe that it's a portent of the coming of this age of the spider where the moon itself will crack open and the realms will be absolutely covered top to bottom in arachnids and as we'll explore that's why they venerate and revere spiders that's kind of integral into their worship and understanding of gorgamorka and of course, the last theory being a popular one, which is that there is this belief that the power, essence, and soul of dead grot wizards all kind of goes into one place, and that one place is the bad moon itself. Which is an interesting one, because it seems so much less uh, grandiose than the others, but I like it. Now, when the bad moon comes to a realm, it brings hell itself with it. Okay, if you are, say you're in a village and the bad moon just randomly descends upon your skies. The people who are touched by the Bad Moon's light will go insane. Absolutely, they'll start speaking nonsense. Sometimes they'll speak in dead languages that no one should know the words to anymore. Others will fall into horrendous pain and these like fungus growths and they're actually called loon cap mushrooms, which are basically mushrooms infused with magic, will burst from their bodies. If you saw the preview video for this faction, you will see an image and art on there of just these gross bursting from the backs of people as they writhe in agony. When the bad moon comes over you, that part of your world is darkened. There's growths, mold, fungus everywhere. It becomes like the darkness of caves that the gloom spike gets dwell in. 
the lights go out, everything becomes damp, moist, and absolutely covered all over in mold and darkness. And as much as calamity it brings to humans, the Bad Moon is holy and invigorating to the forces of the Gloom Spike Kits. Because when that darkness descends, as the world changes and the realms mold to the Bad Moon's image, every grot underground is going to be super invigorated and excited and rush towards the surface. So these huge waves and mobs of grots start pouring out of caves, caverns, holes in the earth, anything like that. They're followed up by lumbering Trogoths with them. The Bad Moon calls them out to conquer, kill, rampage, and indulge. And for the briefest moment, the world becomes a place of twisted madness, horror, and fear. Now it's undetermined how long a, the Bad Moon will stay in a particular area. Some believe that the right leader can keep it on you, meaning if there is a leader who is grandiose enough, doing big enough things, toppling entire civilizations, the Bad Moon will stay and hover over them as sort of a sign of approval or blessing. But of course, it's super erratic, and Grotz have this tendency to die, so if that leader is struck down in battle at the height of his madness, the Bad Moon will leave. And with this increased speed since the Necroquake, where it's just going 0 to 60 all across the realms, slowing down to see uh, the rise of certain tribes conquer nearby cities, and then instantly bolting off to another one to do the same thing far away. Uh, with this erratic course across the realms and the Void itself, it is awakening the darkest depths and the deepest mountains. I was excited about reading this because this is one of the few times that we see massive ramifications of what Nagash has done with the Necroquake. We read about it being important. If you read the book Soul Wars, we know it affected Azir, but we haven't seen true implications and uh, setting off a wrecking ball that's just toppling through the realms and ripping out the worst of the things that live beneath us is a real consequence. The belief in Gorkamorka and the ascension of the Bad Moon are cornerstones of this army. As far as the Gloom Spike gets collectively themselves, well, it's a combination of disparate factions in the realms kind of coming together. Like I said before, Moon Clan Grotz, they are devout religious fanatics uh, who believe in the Bad Moon and Gorkamorka himself. They dwell in the deepest caves and uh, their skin is even burned by the sunlight. They've rejected the sun for so long. They mainly stick to their caves, uh, breeding squigs, farming mushrooms, making all kinds of toxins and brews, and they'll occasionally go out with these big raiding parties and just go ransack a town or a city, something like that, uh, to get pieces of fabric, crude weapons, anything they can kind of get their hands on. The spider fang grots, as we said before, venerate, revere, breed, and use arachnids from across the realms. In the lore in the book, they're not given a ton of ties to Gorka Morka himself, but they do uh, kind of understand his relation to their spider god. So they're almost a bit more like the bone splitters if we're kind of comparing uh, Grotz to Oryx, where they see the beast as being a representative of Gorka Morka himself. That's the bone splitters. It's the same kind of concept, but this is a, a very specific focus on the spiders right, the spirit of their deity residing in the form of something. And last of these sub-factions are the Tragas. These are the lumbering behemoths that live in the most uninhabitable parts of the realms. They rise to feed often and viciously, and they see the grots leading them to food. And so that's how they have this kind of tenuous partnership. They have a very low level of intelligence, and of course the grots have a high level of sneakiness to try and coerce them to doing things but they become a powerful ally when they need a strong arm. And frankly, all these factions, I'll kind of spoil a little bit, the way that they work together is because they're mutual survivors. Neither of the Grot factions, uh, they both understand that they can't do a whole lot in terms of physical might on the battlefield compared to, say, Bone Splitters, Iron Jaws, where the orcs are so much bigger and tougher and more resilient. They understand, okay, we're smaller, we have to work together to accomplish our goals, and they've been able to kind of loop in the Trogoths with them. They all inhab inhabit very similar environments, like literal environments, dark, dank caves, not a lot of light. Uh, they like the, the mold and the creatures that grow there, like the squigs and the Trogoths, you know, all those things. It's just perfect conditions for creating allies of convenience. So, as I always close these videos, my favorite part of the whole thing, why is this faction cool? And it's going to set the precedent for our entire week. And I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Uh, I struggled with the, the first opening couple of pages with the lore in this book. 
Because at first it kind of felt like it had the Giran problem, if you've seen that video I did for Giran, where it just bounces through a lot of different things, but doesn't develop them well, but you have to kind of read the entire book to understand what's going on. Right, because it bounces between Gorkamorka and the Bad Moon, and fact and myth, and it goes back and forth between these things multiple times. So it can be a little bit hard to follow, but when you read the whole thing, and you sit with it for a little bit, I found it to be a very rewarding read. It's a book that's uh, kind of like Gur, the way Gur is written in the core rule book, where um, it's weak in some lore areas, but exceeds anything we've seen before in others. Just like the realm of Gur has no history, the other realms all seem to, and you're like, oh, this is a huge thing that's missing here. Uh, Gur did a great job of showing you what life is like there, which no other sections did. Well, this book is the same. The, the lore segment that I think they're kind of the weakest on is the end game. When I say end game, I mean um, the forces of order want to see the realms liberated. Uh, the Daughters of Cain, Marathi wants to become a god. Uh, they, all the Chaos armies want to subjugate the realms in their own unique ways, like Zinch, Slanesh, you know, they're all very different. So everyone kind of has like their end thing that they're working to. And, and in this book, it's a little bit convoluted. They have something called the Everdenk that is mentioned, where uh, apparently the, room, the realms themselves will always be under the grasp of the bad moon, but it's not really described or articulated how that's going to happen. So it can be a little bit hard to understand like motivations of why this is going to happen. Uh, there's nothing about how the bad moon is going, is it going to grow in size to eclipse all the realms? Is it, all the realms going to come together so the bad moon sits in the center and everyone can see it? Again, zero information. It's kind of like um, in the Fire Slayers Battle Tome, they don't really give you an end game to what happens when they use up all the Urgold. If you're familiar with that one, you should go listen to those videos. It is it is a huge thing that's missing. So I found that a bit confusing. I was rereading the book multiple times to try and get an understanding of what their end goal is. Uh, however, like I said, there's a part that they're weak at, but then they do something better than any other Battle Tome. And this is really what I want to focus on, and that is putting this army in the context of this universe. Let me give you like what I think is the perfect example, okay? If you crack open any other battle tome, I'll take my Fire Slayer one for example, uh, they're gonna show you two or three kind of variations, if you will, like, oh, these are Fire Slayers from Akshi, these are Fire this is a lodge from this other place, you know what I mean? They'll give you a little variety. And then there's always this page in every book where it's like, here's a listing of like 12 different Fire Slayer Lodges from different realms. Here's an icon for them and like three or four sentences about what makes them unique, how they're different. And it's fine. It's a little bit of lore fodder to help you kind of, you know, kind of get a little inspiration. It doesn't overpower you with information, but you're like, eh, I could do something like that. However, in this book, this thing that goes so much further to putting each, fa uh, each clan of the Gloomspite gets into the mortal realm. So uh, instead of that, these guys have multi-paragraph entries describing factions, their leaders, their forces. They give you truly fleshed out seeds of inspiration. I believe on one page there's even a map where they're located at. They tell you the parts of Shyish that they're in and you can create these very elaborate histories that are broad enough for you to fill in your own story, but they really, again, put them in the context of the universe like no other book has done before. And there's seven of these ideas out there where you can really dive in. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of them is the Bad Snatchers. They live in Olgu. They have a, a leader that's named and a character to go with them. And there's enough lore to build an army around them, uh, but nothing is limited. But I say limiting, I mean like um, some of those blurbs will be like, and they focus on Spider Fang, right? You know, where, where in other battle tomes, an equivalent, it would say like they focus on blank. So your brain says, oh, I'm not going to do that unless I'm going to focus on that too. Nope, in this, they have everything at their disposal and they just invite you to really dive into this. And one of the common kind of criticisms of Age of Sigmar, it's one that I have myself, I'll be honest with you, is that uh, things can be so abstract that you can have a setting and sometimes the characters don't feel like they fit into that setting super well without like explaining how they fit in. And again, I think this book does the single best job of doing that. So... Uh, lore writers, if you're listening, thumbs up. You did great. As for the, uh, the kind of downside that I talked about earlier, having no end game, I did kind of chat with this over a viewer on, uh, I believe it was Twitter, and their suggestion was simply that because every sub faction has their view of Gorkamorka and, and the Bad Moon itself, that their end games would all be different. And he's absolutely true. So, capsulating that with a single end game, even though these factions are united, they still have very different ideologies within that. So, that was kind of his point. 
and I wanted to present that because uh, it's a great idea. And another thing that stands out with this faction, moving on with more stuff that I really, really like about it, is the scale and mystery of it. So, uh, like with Skaven, there are nearly an unending numbers of Grots in the realms. Right, their total number is unimaginable. And it's full of fantastic beasts like the Trogoths and psychopaths and delusional leaders. But, because the Bad Moon's been away and they've been living in secret, generally speaking, for most of history as we know it, uh, all that history has gone unseen. However, when you're reading the Battle Tome, they have a very jam-packed history within the realms because underground, where we haven't looked before, from our reader perspective of the Black Library books, they've had big histories, warfares, the rise and fall of leaders, uh, religious and warlike. They've seen themselves burrowing accidentally into Fire Slayer Lodges, and they've had complete acts of genocide on a mass scale on both ends, but on the surface, it's utter silence. So just like with uh, Carriage and Overlords, where they spent most of their time in the sky completely detached from the events that we've known in the Rumgate Wars and the history that it showed us, we have another society here that has existed in utter seclusion. They have a, a super divergent history from anything else. And the lore writing team has done a great job of really filling it in and making it very rich. It's an incredibly fun book to explore. Uh, kind of have your mind open about it because it is kind of all over the place. We're talking about a faction that is filled with uh, grandiose myth. They're not the most intelligent creatures. And frankly, they're very crazy. Like there are actually insane people who are hopped up on all kinds of shrooms or spider fang venom is kind of clouding their mind and poisoning them long term and so no one is thinking straight all the people who would record history are utterly out of their minds and so it's a hard faction when you first glance at it to grasp but reading this book is incredibly rewarding and friends that will conclude our introductory understanding of the gloom spike gets and as i said the rest of this week we're going to be focusing on various sub factions going to kick it off with the moon clan grots spider fang trogoths and then we're going to look at the leaders of the army because they really need their own video because you got to talk about all the crazy people they lead but the character and depth put into the leaders particularly uh the named loon king here is impeccable and truly deserves its own video. So uh, I'm just gonna make as many as I can, as I see fit. It's an incredibly, like I said, deep faction. I'm enjoying reading this book uh, more and more. And I sincerely hope you join me for the trip. So thank you all so much for watching. And I look forward to seeing you in my next lore video. Get some hobby done and happy wargaming.